All right. So um, I think we'll we we can get started um, in the meantime. So I just first of all want to say a big welcome to everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. This is the the first time we are doing this, where we're collecting so many of our uh, supporters together in one room, and it actually feels like something we should be doing and should have done uh, more often. So it's a unique space. Um, I some of you have been with us for. Uh, 15 years, all the way from the beginning. Uh, many of you have been with us for at least a decade as well. Um, some of you are, are brand new uh, or even just um, exploring uh, Olico initially at this um, point. So what we're going to discuss today um, is just some of the results and some of our learnings that came out of the Xenix Foundation's uh, study or, or backlogs, senior phase maths backlogs um, project. Uh, and really, I think to, to make clear from the, this isn't a fundraising exercise from our side, we're not trying to raise additional funds, we're really wanting to contribute into the into deepening some of the learnings and some of uh, our experiences and results, um, or our experiences of this project as well. So uh, I think before we get going, though, uh, I'd like to hand over to Gail Campbell from the Xenix Foundation. She's the CEO of the Xenix Foundation. Um, and just to introduce us a little bit into uh, why the Xenix Foundation was interested initially in this project. Um, so Gail, if I can hand over to you. Um, thanks, thanks, Andrew, and um, good good morning, um, everyone. Um, it's uh, great to be with you in this discussion with Oli Cole. So, Briefly, just for Xenix Foundation, our, our focus areas are um, maths language literacy. And um, strategically, we thought we'd intervene at two um, key areas in, in schooling. The first is in the foundation phase or early grades, and that is um, to build the foundational skills. And then we looked at grade eight and nine as the two years of the senior phase, not, not grade um, seven, eight and nine just logistically because it was in high school. And um, we identified the problem there from Tim's and from various other work that, that we've been doing that um, there's really a big gap in terms of learners in both the in both mathematics and in um, English being the language of teaching and learning in grades seven and eight. And our theory of change is if 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 I can term it that is if we can do something at grade eight and nine, one um we would have more learners um, who would take up mathematics in grade 10 because we saw increasingly the number of, of, of learners who were taking maths lit at grade, uh, at grade 10 um, and the reducing number in mathematics. And um, that also through the language components, they, um, they would also be more prepared for the FET phase. Um, we've worked with Oli Cole on, on the maths component. And it, why Oli Cole is that it particularly had an understanding of looking at maths and understanding learning backlogs that learners have in mathematics and addressing some of the core foundational mathematical concepts that learners need in order then to, to progress into FET. We also did an impact evaluation because we wanted to get a body of evidence of what works, what can work in terms of um, improving mathematics at grade eight and nine, and particularly improving it to the level where learners can then take mathematics at, at, at grade 10 level. And 
Andrew, this I think is a conversation that we can have afterwards, because with that evidence, we are beginning to think about what does this mean systemically? Because we did this project, invested in the impact evaluation to look further now what what does this mean in terms of both scale that's more schools or more learners but also what does it mean systemically in terms of us engaging with government for uptake so thanks Andrew I'll hand it back to you thanks so much Gail I appreciate it so um, I am going to share my screen now and take you through this. So uh, I think um, I will keep this as, um, as tight as I can um, and, and speak for about 15, 20 minutes, just uh, back, uh, give us decent information uh, or decent background into this uh, backlogs project that ran over a couple of years. Um, and then we hopefully will have about uh, 20 minutes um, for any questions or discussions. Um, and I'd like to bring sort of some other voices of my colleagues into the discussion as well. So um, let's get started, for, especially for those of you who may be a little bit new to Olico. We started in 2008 and we really built around this idea that maths is meant to make sense. And the reason why this is important is because so many of our learners, this uh, is not true for them. And so they have this almost magical understanding of mathematics that it's some random sort of thing that they sometimes get wrong, sometimes get right. There's no sense that there's a logical structure and impinging it. So everything that we do is built around the sense making and confidence building uh, for mathematics. And then we work in obviously the lived reality for most of our learners that by the time they enter high school in grade eight, the majority are at least two to three years be fine. Uh, and this is a, a quite often quoted stat from uh, a paper by Paul and Kotzer from 2015. And in some sense, it's, it's even a little bit misleading. And, and I'll come back to that towards the end, uh, because in some sense, it's actually a little bit worse than that. But more recent data as well was uh, available on a high school readiness evaluation that was run by the WITS Mass Connect project, which obviously sits at, U at WITS uh, University. And this was also a Xenex funded um, project. And it had a look at where learners are as they enter into high school in terms of their abilities. So this instrument looked at grade five, grade six, grade seven uh, items and a couple of grade eight items. Um, and as you can see, the vast majority of our learners fall between 20 and 40%. And so are carrying significant, significant um, backlogs into their high school careers. Uh, and the reason why, I, uh, a second reason why the Spitz Mass Connect Diagnostic is interesting is because it does uh, give us a little bit of a baseline to work from for the, the evaluation we'll be discussing now, uh, and I'll bring that up a little bit later. But specifically around Olico's high school program, it works after school, learners attend two to three times a week. We have a blended use of tutoring and technology. We are pretty clear that technology on its own uh, is quite limited in, in what it can do, especially working with the types of learners, the kind of learners that we work with. Uh, but a critical component is a skilled, uh, well-trained and enthusiastic tutor. Most of our tutors come uh, from nearby universities. The learners enroll in Olico at the start of their high school careers in grade eight, and they enroll on a first come, first serve basis. So they voluntarily select to join this after school maths program. In terms of the maths approach, we focus on two key elements and areas. Uh, critical is number fluency, so really getting learners on top of basic maths facts like their times tables uh, and understanding, uh, conceptual understanding of things like fractions, uh, integers, those kind of things, so that learners really can reduce the cognitive load required of them as they get into more and more advanced mathematics. And then we have identified some key concepts that we think are really critical for learners to be able to get on top of in order to be able to access grade 10, 11, 12 mathematics and succeed ultimately once they leave uh, school. But fundamentally, fundamentally, what we have to do uh, in all of our interactions with learners is to change their orientation and disp disposition towards mathematics. This is the main, the fundamental challenge for teachers across South Africa 
uh, is to fundamentally change the learner's orientation. And I'll say a little bit more of that towards the end. Uh, but ultimately, what we want to be able to do is to enable learners to access and succeed at grade 10 to 12 math. And when we, we, we use 50% as sort of a baseline mark for learners to achieve. So in our experience, if you get 50% or more for pure maths in metric, uh, the options available to you are significant. The most learners will be able to study at a quality tertiary institution, plus they'll be able to access funding by NISFIS. So 50% is our bare minimum, uh, and what we regard as uh, uh, the start of a quality uh, maths class. So just to give you a little bit of concept uh, context uh, before we get into the backlogs project that was um, funded by Xenex. Uh, this, we originally started in 2012 in a school in Deep Slits and wanted to give you a sense of what that impact meant over a couple of years. So if you look here, we have a distribu distribution graph of the types of maths, metric maths passes that was happening at this Deep Slits school. So before Oleka got involved in 2018, the metric cohort in the school, more than 50% of them failed mathematics, about 20% scored between 30 and 49%, uh, and less than 20% of them were scoring above 50% for math. In 2019, half of that class was enrolled in Olico, and we saw immediately a reduction in the failure rate, uh, plus a very significant increase in the number of learners who were scoring above 50% in that 2019 group. Most of those learners were Olico learners. In 2020, 83% of the class enrolled in Olico. Almost none of them failed. Uh, about half scored between 30 and 49, uh, but half of the learners scored above 50% for mathematics. And then in 2021, there were no failures. 25% of the learners scored between 30 and 49 uh, to pass, but 75% of those learners scored above 50% uh, for mathematics in their metric year. So what this meant for this particular school is in 2018, if you looked at their ranking in terms of their maths average across all Kauteng based schools, they scored, they were 517th out of about 600 odd schools. By 2021, they were 17th. So this includes suburban schools, it includes your good uh, formal Model C schools. Uh, so significant improvement there. If we look at only the quintile one, two, three schools, so our no fee schools in Gauteng, in 2018, they ranked 201st for maths average uh, across Gauteng quintile one, two, three schools. And by 2021, they were the top performing in terms of maths average across all Gauteng quintile one, two, three schools. So the Xenex Foundation Maths Backlogs Project then essentially gives us an opportunity to test the scalability of this initial uh, proof of concept in one uh, that we were able to establish in that one deep learned school. It is a learner-focused intervention, um, and it rolled out in 10 schools across Kauteng. The evaluation followed a learner cohort through grade 8 and grade 9 in 2021 and 2022. And really what we're looking to get out of it is to deepen our understanding of what it takes to meaningfully overcome maths backlogs. So in terms of the quantitative data and the assessment instru instruments that were used, the independent evaluators did two evaluations. The first evaluation happened 18 to 22 weeks into the project. The reason it was so delayed as opposed to obviously in an ideal world, we would have uh, done this evaluation right at the beginning is because of COVID uncertainties. So you'll remember in 2021, there was a whole bunch of confusion around schools. There was lots of rotational schooling as well. And as a result, that initial evaluation was only able to be delivered 18 to 22 weeks into the project. And then the final evaluation, two weeks towards the end of the second year, uh, 55 weeks into treatment uh, for early colonists. So in some sense, it's worth looking at it, in our opinion, sort of looking at this first evaluation as a mid-treatment, as the learners had already received a lot of support from Olico over this period, and then looking at the final evaluation as the post-treatment stuff. Then what, uh, fortunately for us, is we did have some data from that WITS Maths Connect uh, diagnostic assessment that took place in 2021. 
So uh, we had a small group of learners who wrote both that and the Zenex evaluations. And then we repeated this, the WITS Maths Diva assessment again in 2023 and got exactly the same results. So confirmed some of that stuff that we had seen in that initial group. And then lastly, what we, we've had a look at the grade four term results, uh, term, grade four, term four school reports for learners who were part of uh, this treatment to see, not so much to see, to use the reports as some analysis as to their maths abilities, but what we would expect to see in term four school reports is a gap between learners who'd received oligo treatment and those who hadn't. So if we look at the outcomes of these assessments, so the wits diva assessment, which we are regarding as um, as as reasonably with reasonable high levels of confidence as a pre-treatment uh, assessment, shows that there's actually very little difference uh, between Olico learners and their control group. And to be honest, it, we were we were a little bit surprised by that. We did expect to see a bigger motivational gap between Olico learners and the control group, group because Olico learners are self-selecting onto a math program. We expected to see some prior advantage. Uh, it is there, it's, but it's very slight, very small, and not very significant at all. In terms of the sample size, uh, there's over 300 Olico learners and over 170 control groups. So um, it's a decent sample size. Uh, and so we have reasonable levels of confidence um, that this is an accurate assessment of what is happening between control and Olico. So if we look at the independent evaluation, then that took place. So the mid treatment took place, as I said, uh, roughly 20 weeks into treatment. Um, you can see an increasing gap between Olico learners in green and the control group uh, learners in yellow. And you can see that gap increase further at the end on the final evaluation, uh, 55 weeks into the treatment. So if if we can take the vitz diva data as, um, as valid, uh, then we can definitely see some good evidence that Olico learners are benefiting from what they've been receiving over this period. And then lastly, if we looked at the school reports of learners across the 10 schools in Gauteng, we can see a very significant difference and advantage for learners who've been attending Olico compared to the learners who selected and elected uh, not to attend. So in the words of the independent evaluator, the quantitative impact analysis provides clear evidence of improving learner performance schools, scores, a consistent improvement of scores at each of these grade level items in the project control design. Consequently, we reliably conclude that the Olico model slash program has achieved impact on reducing backlog. So what does this all mean? Um, and uh, I wanted to, to just chat very briefly around sort of some of the projections because we're seeing um, what we what we believe is some good evidence uh, to support the effectiveness of after school programming and math support, and uh, but I think it's it's often it's difficult to describe exactly how bad the situation is in terms of math performance in South Africa, and I think an important part to making real inroads is is really to to start with what we can, and even though the numbers might look small, they they can be very significant even um, at a systemic level. So if we use Alex as a good example of this, if we look at the uh, the, at, um, Alec, uh, the population of Alex, there are about 500 to 750,000 people who live in this township in Gauteng. It's one of the most densely populated areas in South Africa. There are five high schools. There are potentially two and a half thousand metrics annually um, graduating through these high schools. Uh, a little exercise that I often uh, use with uh, people who are interested in the space is to ask people to predict how many learners do you think matriculate out of this 2,500 who score a math mark above 50%. Um, and I will let you put that number in your head uh, briefly. Um, the reality, I think, is if we had a situation where we have two and a half thousand matriculants and uh, say a thousand kids were getting through with 50% or more, we would be 
quite worried about the system itself. If 500 kids were getting through with 50% or more, we'd be desperately worried about the situation. If less than 100, we would be in panic straits. And unfortunately, the reality that is that on average, only 48 kids every year from the whole of Alex passed metric maths with 50% or more. So what does this mean for this cohort that has been part of this uh, Zenex senior phase uh, backlogs project? who are now in grade 10. So this is the average number of learners who have got through maths with 50% or more from Alex. Uh, the current group will matriculate in 2025, um, and we will more than double the average number of learners who have passed, who will pass maths with 50% or more in Alex over the last, um, over recent history, and we can actually go back even further if we want to. So we're saying that we've seen some really strong, uh, even though this is a small project, we've seen some strong systemic influence. So the the literally the number of learners passing with fifty percent more for maths across the whole of Alex will double as a result of this really actually quite small project um, in three of our ten schools that happen to be based in Alex. So. This brings us to some of these sort of key lessons that we've learned out of this um, process, okay? The first one is it really is all about the learner's entire orientation towards mathematics, where by the time learners get into high school, uh, you, we know they're still counting on their fingers, they don't have a sense-making approach, and any intervention really has to take this into account in order for learners to genuinely be able to get on top of this uh, subject. It's important that as we look to work with learners on their backlog, that we're making strong connection to their grade level curriculum work. And so what we've tried to do, as I mentioned previously, is just to identify what the key concepts that learners need to get on top of, so that they can then work on their backlogs as those connect into their curriculum level work. Um, and that's really quite a critical part of any backlogs um, work. The after-school sector in particular is uniquely advantaged for learner-focused work. Um, it does give us, it's the one space in the schooling system where we can work outside of the very high demands of the CAPS curriculum. And we can do some of that foundational work and some of the backlog work that is needed without having to uh, worry about making sure we got through all, the, all of the exact CAPS work for that week. But in doing that, fundamentally underpins the support for CAPS engagement in the classroom. So in many ways, this is a support for the learner, or it is directly supporting the learner, but in many ways, it actually supports the teacher in the classroom as well, because the elephant in the room is that learners are entering into the classroom and they're not at that grade level, but if they're attending good quality after school sessions, um, especially around, on subjects like mathematics, then they enter into the class and better equipped and better able to access the work there. Uh, we can't really uh, overemphasize the effect of a good school tutor uh, or school coordinator. We just seen time and time what a difference that makes. If you've got a good tutor, a good school co coordinator, uh, learners respond incredibly well to that. And one of the one of the things we've been most um, impressed with is the young people that have joined uh, Olika over the last year. And we have this whole massive, almost untapped resource of young people uh, who are at university, um, who have time to come into tutor and can really make massive benefits uh, to learners that they're interacting with. And then lastly, there was a little bit of an unexpected lesson for us uh, during this Backbox project, and that was the potential effectiveness of WhatsApp um, and so during COVID, obviously, with everybody going at home, we did a lot of online remote work. Um, and we've con continued to run the WhatsApp Maths hotline. Um, this year, already, we've had over 15,000 learners access this hotline uh, to speak to a tutor and to get help with their maths work. So something really, really interesting uh, is happening uh, around that. Uh, we're still uh, getting on top of it, I think, and still learning about it basically every day around what's an effective intimate in intervention in that uh, model. But it's what's, in, what's definitely sure is that kids are responding to it and they are asking for help to speak to a tutor. 
So the last question then was something that um, Gail mentioned uh, in the beginning. Uh, it's really around, so what does this mean for systems influence? Because I, ultimately that's what we all want. We want to be able to see some improving systems. We want, we want a reduction in the decay that we see around us all the time. And we want to be able to see a future that's brighter than uh, often that we're able to see at the moment. So how then do we influence the system? And I think there's uh, two strands to potential scaling opportunities. And I'm grateful to Mary and Gail for some of the, uh, influencing some of the thinking around this. The first one is really just scaling for outcomes. So uh, it's a learner-focused approach, uh, learners-focused intervention. And that really just means going as wide as we can. Um, and ultimately to be a little bit crass, I mean, it's it's essentially just time and money. You, you need five years with kids and you need enough money to be able to give them good quality support from tutors uh, and school coordinators. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how much that is now. But the other piece that is potentially the more important uh, or the more interesting piece around systems influence is around embedded opportunities. So having been in this very privileged Space. I've been able to focus very intensively on senior phase mathematics. Uh, we believe we, we've got some uh, useful contributions that can make that, uh, that can influence the system, uh, especially at a, at a school uh, and broader level. But let's talk briefly just around sort of scale for outcomes and money. Um, and it's just to, in some sense, this is provocative. Uh, and, and it's just to give a sense of where do we actually sit in this whole space. So. It costs us somewhere around about 4,000 Rand per learner per year or 20,000 Rand per learner over five years. If we looked at how 10, you know, and we wanted to do something crazy, let's say, okay, there are 440 quintile one to four schools in Kauteng. I've included quintile four because they get the same results as quintile one to three. Um, each year, just under 4,000 learners passed maths across the whole of Gauteng quintile one to four schools with a mark above 50% annually. If we wanted to double that, and if we wanted to bring that up to 8,000 learners, it would cost about 140 million rand a year to do that. Now, obviously that's a lot of money. Uh, it is, it's a lot of money, there's no question around that. But if you look at it in proportion to the provincial budget, it's 0.23% of the provincial budget. Bearing in mind, there are lots of fixed costs, obviously, but even if we say that 90% of that provincial budget is fixed costs um, and 10% is discretionary spend, uh, what this would represent is less than 2% of your discretionary spend, and you would be able to double the number of 50% maths passes in the whole of Gauteng. In Western Cape, it's even more interesting because there's fewer learners. There's 171 quintile one to four schools, 770 learners on average pass across all of the quintile one to four schools um, in the Western Cape with a maths mark above 50%. So if you wanted to double that, it's gonna cost you 34 million rand a year. So again, it's a lot of money, but on some sense it's 0.12% of the provincial budget. If we look at it in terms of discretionary spend, it's one point two percent. But and and there is good um, uh, sort of. Uh, sorry, I lost my my words there. But there's the precedent. Well, looking there's good precedent for it. Uh, if we look at what's happening both in Qatar and Western Cape, but in particular in the Western Cape with their back on track project, um, it is the right way for us to be going to be working through. Uh, to be intensely focusing on the backlogs uh, that learners are encountering. But then lastly, just to end uh, this here, uh, and to just to chat briefly around some of what we're seeing as what we're referring to as embedded opportunities as a result. So what Olico does have is we've, we've been extremely privileged over the last 10 years to really focus very, very intensively on senior phase mathematics. And we've learned a lot in that process, specifically looking at how we move from backlogs into a grade level curriculum. And so there's a number of opportunities um, and Lynn would be able to speak very, very well and uh, clearly on a lot of these, but, but just to, to raise a couple that I think are, is exciting us as we think uh, around strategically where we want to go over the next little while. The one is to really look at how we improve the wraparound support for teachers or practitioners 
that's in some sense more closely linked to curriculum. So how do we ensure that what's happening in the classroom, that the resources that are there, such as the workbooks, such as additional resources for teachers, maybe some WhatsApp support, potentially videos, online content, how do we make this more better, um, more well integrated into the system? Because we know that high performing countries, they carefully link their materials to curriculum and they have regular review in that. And we think there's a contribution that we can make along with other partners who've been working in this space uh, that we can better equip our teachers in the classroom uh, and beyond. We do think there's a really interesting opportunity to extend what we're doing, especially some in-school support in our regional hubs. So for example, to reference Alex as a hub in itself, uh, to look at how we extend some of what we're doing into the school itself uh, and able to increase our influence, not just on the kids who are attending in the after school space, uh, but also those, uh, those learners who are coming to school uh, or during their in-school uh, time as well. And part of this is also around developing young teachers and to really emphasize that the young people that we've had involved in this project over the last few years have really been incredibly uh, impressive. And with good sort of support and training, they've been able to deliver some really, really uh, good results out of their various schools. And one of the things we've been throwing around is, is an example, perhaps there's a partial HGB post that, that uh, could be implemented in some of these schools where, where one of our facilitators then takes on a couple of grade eight or grade nine classes, really works on their backlogs, um, and then also works in the afternoon on the after school. Uh, project. So that that in a sum, in a nutshell, that's um, quite a lot of info. I think I've tried to crack uh, into the session. Um, and lastly, I just want to say a big thank you. So firstly, obviously, to uh, to Gail and the Zenix Foundation um, for your support and your uh, confidence uh, in us and allowing us to really, I think, to move um, quite quite a long way in our understanding of maths backlogs over the last few years but also to many of you on the call who have been strong supporters of Oleco for many years. Uh, we're really grateful. Uh, and hopefully you found this interesting and, um, and thought provoking as well. So that's, that is pretty much everything then from, um, from my side. And I am on time, which I'm pleased about. So uh, we have, um, uh, I would like to open it up if anybody has uh, any questions or anything that they would like to um, to raise or bring. Uh, I think I think if you do have any questions, if you could just um, uh, or comments, uh, you're welcome. Please just unmute yourself um, uh, if you can't turn you on your, your video. Great, but otherwise, um, yeah, take it from there. Hi, hi, Andrew. I'm Laura from the uh, Binding Constraints Lab. Um, quick question: the five years. How how long? I mean, what can you do in two years or three years or one years with a kid? Uh, that's a great question, um, and I would like to bring uh, some other voices into it. Can I bounce this to you, Lynn? Would you be happy to take on that question? Because that's a good, good one. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Lynn Bowie, and, and I'm the, the maths director at, at Arlico. Um, So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think that, you know, it depends on which years you're talking about what you can do. So, you know, we've certainly seen... Um, projects that are focused on uh, grade 11 and 12, you know, one, two years of, of, of kind of support at that um, time. In general, those that are achieving results there tend to um, be taking in learners who already are at a slightly higher level. So that's one kind of thing. Um, and 
The other thing that, 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 I mean, so certainly you can achieve something there. We've seen kind of schools where they've kind of had kids in from seven in the morning till seven in the evening for their whole grade 12 year and their pass rates have gone up. So there is no question that you can achieve something. I think that there's a little concern. I have some concern there about quite what that cramming actually does achieve in terms of learners' ability to continue into university. And we're seeing the universities getting quite twitchy about um, those kind of crammed matric results. So, I, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but you can definitely achieve something in a year or two. Quite what is a question I'd, I I would, you know, there's, there, there's some concerns I'd have there. The other thing I think that is about the sort of starting earlier and a very important reason for us to start earlier is the enormous loss of learners to math, maths literacy. So we're seeing that just increasing over time that in fact, we need to be trying to get learners at grade eight, nine level so that they actually are able to take maths in grade 10. The percentage of learners taking maths versus maths lit um, is kind of, yeah, you know, as you've seen over time, just dropping enormously the, the, the number taking mass. So certainly our, uh, the, the kind of um, benefit of working with learners in grade eight and nine is you can really go deep and build their, um, build some of that, that foundational knowledge, hopefully get them up to a level where they can take maths in, in grade 10 um, and then succeed at it. So we do an intense focus at grade eight, nine, um, and then let, you know, support them through um, from 10, 11, 12. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, very much, thank you. Thanks, Bridget. Hi, it's so great to, um, sorry, I'm looking at, a different screen. Um, it's so great to hear the the feedback and the and finally you got the the results that I think you've been um sort of the the being able to track um impact over time that um yeah you've been you've been working to get. So really congratulations. I think um it, it is just exceptional and exceptionally scary um when you look at really I, I think particularly that 48 um out of all the schools, it just, it, it is such a call to action. I guess my question, uh, Andrew, is, I have many questions, but um, I'll keep it to one, which is, you speak about the scale in terms of the budget that would be needed to run this over many schools. Has Oliko thought through what that might look like in practice in terms of how many young people would be needed, where we would need to get them from, what training would look like, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, the, the short answer is is uh, it's a it's a little bit of a terrifying uh, prospect. I think is probably if we're going to be completely honest on that. I so for me, um, Bridget, because this is we've been talking a lot about it internally as a team, you know, and so there's there's some important stuff. But the first thing is that we don't need to own any of this. So everything that we've um, done and developed is open source. We believe it does need to be implemented in a very particular kind of way. But other people can take this, they can take materials, they can take our online resources, all that kind of stuff, um, and they can be working on this um, in their own context as well. I think we're finding, the second thing, we're finding immense value from being very intensively focused in hub, um, because a big part of a successful intervention at a school is the level of trust that we are able to get with uh, the schooling executive, the schooling team, um, the the staff and the learners themselves. So that so we we certainly see um, any sort of growing or scaling thing as being based around establishing well functioning hubs. I mean, what we really quite potentially quite excited about uh, looking over the next decade is with a really strong presence in places in a community like Alex as well as in Deep Surf here in Kauteng. Uh, I, I think we're going to see fundamental differences in these two townships over the next um, uh, decade or so. And then the last thing to say is, I think for any real scaling at that sort of level, that that um, sort of indicating there, we, we we must do it with government. You know, we have to get government on board. It can't just be a a privately funded or corporately funded uh, intervention. And there's a number of reasons for that. But, uh, you know, one of the important ones is that what we're wanting to do everywhere is also help uh, 
inject some level of accountability into the system. And that would be one of the ways for us to do that is for for the government to put sort of money in, um, skin in the game by putting money into, into it. Um, uh, how we do that, uh, we don't know, to be totally honest. But I think there's um, that's something that we're really keen to look at um, over the next little while. And, and I think uh, it, there's certainly some very, very interesting um, stuff happening in the Western Cape with the Back on Track project where, where there's money being very, very deliberately directed to backlogs work and to catch up and whatever you want to call it and describe it as. Uh, and that's something that I think we've got to advocate for very intensively. Um, and the last thing is, is I think the importance of after school in, in terms of being able to intervene with backlogs uh, and, uh, and catch up work uh, is really critical and, and uh, such a, uh, an opportunity, I think, for us to, um, to leverage more. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Bridget. Um, Rob? Um, hi, and well done. Um, that really looks like an amazing set of results. Um, I'm interested in whether your pitch to government is that um, this is compensating for poor high schools. In other words, this is a chronic need that will continue for as long as we've, we've got high schools like we do. And, and maybe forever, or whether this is compensating for poor junior schools. So yeah. if you can just get the foundation phase and mm. kind of middle years right, then you won't need after school programs. What's, yeah. what's the what's yeah. the pitch? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm going to bring Lynn onto this, but just a quick thing be before that as well is, um, so I think if we just look even in sort of the suburban context, so the vast majority of high performing maths learners um they they go to extra tutoring um uh, and you are you know investing quite a lot of money in additional support around that so i suspect there is a need for additional support in some kind that is ongoing um and uh but but yeah so that would be then the initial sort of piece around that in terms of what is it doing well, let me let me bounce to London then if there's anything up. And I don't know if Gail, if you want to add in some of the work that you've been focusing on at Xenix as well. Aaron, so Rob, certainly, I mean, you know, I mean, that's the problem with the, the South African education system is that there's there, there are problems all the way along. So certainly if you improved primary maths, uh, a whole lot of these problems wouldn't be occurring at high school. However, we still see that we need to do a lot of intense work with our grade eight, nine teachers in maths in particular, because often at high schools, the least qualified teachers are put onto grade eight, nine maths. And so that kind of move into algebra um, that is meant to happen at the start of high school isn't happening well. And that will still be a problem even if your primary school maths is, is fixed. And, and then I think, like Andrew says, I mean, I, I think we can't underestimate it and why I'd like to also just echo the support for the after school space is there is so much about after school that is important. Like, firstly, that in any well functioning school, there are all sorts of support going on after school and some of it is privately paid for. Um, you know, if you think about the um, the, the well-to-do schools, there's, you know, people are getting tutors for their kids left, right and center, but the schools themselves are offering really good quality kind of after school support. And then in addition to this, in terms of the situation um, that learners find themselves in townships, in fact, after school is really important, particularly for girl children to enable them to be able to do homework after school and not be put into kind of caring for um, their siblings, etc., or cooking supper. So there's a whole lot of reasons why I think after school for learners remains important and will remain important no matter what we fix. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, it's it's systemic. We need to fix everything from ECD to primary, um, and then we still will need support in high school. That that would be my take on it. Thanks, Lynn. Gail, would you like to add something from the Xenix perspective? 
Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I, I mean, I'm going to build on what um, Lynn has has been saying. Um, I mean, we all know the impact of socioeconomic factors on a child's trajectory in school. And um, what we've been saying is even if the child had was in a good school, you would still need um, some kind of support to counter uh, uh, balance the effect of um, the circumstances that children find themselves in their homes and communities, which is what Lynn is saying, the importance of after school care um, in, in general. So, and I mean, I'm I'm thinking of the work when, when LEAP started, LEAP school started. I mean, they recognized this and they lengthen the school day to actually do that kind of, 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 of work after school and as well as provide a safe place for children to learn as well as deal with some of the backlog. So I'm supporting Lynn that's saying, even if we're working over time, systemically improving foundational mathematics, improving um, primary school teaching up to high school teaching, I still think there's a very, very strong case to for after school care programs and providing support for learners outside of school. Thanks, girl. Um, Tracy. Um, hi, morning. Can I ask a question? Yes, please go for it. Hi, Tracy. Oh, thanks. Hi, morning, everyone. I just want to say, firstly, thank you for presenting your findings. It's really interesting. Um, I've got two technical questions just about um, the actual implementation itself. Uh, the first one is, how much, uh, how much dosage do the students get? Um, how many hours per week if they attend two or three times? And then also, what is the ratio between tutors and learners that you have on the mm. ground? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Tracy. So... Learners attend uh, for an hour and a half uh, each session. Um, they, they're, very, they're quite structured. Um, we've taken our tutors through a very sort of carefully um, sort of structured intervention. Um, they'll come for, every learner will be there at least twice a week. Um, so they'll get three hours minimum. Uh, and then those learners who are struggling a little bit more than the rest or have missed the session or need to uh, catch up uh, they'll come for a third session on, on the Friday. So they'll get an extra hour and a half um, to two hours in that um, in that regard. And then in terms of the tutor, the learner tutor ratio, so at, uh, for the grade eight and nine, we're looking at 15 learners per tutor. Um, and, and then for 10 to 12, we're looking at 20 learners. The 10 to 12, a little bit more sort of traditional tutoring and, and the learners because they've gone through the eight and nine program are more at the grade level curriculum. So there's a little bit less backlogs work that needs to happen, which means it means it's a little bit easier. But while on this, what's quite um, what we're finding really useful in using technology in the space is enabling the the learners to be very productively involved while tutors are working on a one-on-one -on -one basis, which is often necessary for learners to get unstuck and to actually make that jump from their backlog into their grade level curriculum stuff. So while, while learners are working on particular concepts, uh, there's tutors walking around the room uh, and intervening where they, uh, where they see it's necessary. Um, so yeah, thanks for that question. Thanks so much, Andrew. Uh, just sorry, one last question. How big is the average class? How many learners are in one space? So we, it depends for us uh, the capacity of the computer lab. So that is um, a, a sort of a what did you call it? Like a uh, so uh, a it's a pure logistical sort of limitation, I guess. And in terms of um, the size of the lab, so some of our labs are 50, 55 computers in there. And so we'll take um, we'll put a full group in there, and then we'll put three tutors, for example. Um, and then uh, other labs, there are uh, thirty. 25 to 30 labs, so it will be one 
uh, or two tutors then working with those kids in that space. So, I mean, part of the questions around scale, I mean, if you think about um, those Alex schools, so we will affect, the, we're on track to affect that fairly dramatic improvement in the number of passes, but we will be working with, with less than 10% of the kids in those three schools there, and it will still um, realize that impact. So one of the ways to look at, if we talk about scale or expansion, is just, well, you know, how do we work with a much larger group of proportion of learners at a particular school? And that might actually be a much easier way for us to initially um, increase uh, those numbers and hopefully in time also even uh, decrease costs. Okay, thanks so much. All right, thanks, um, everybody. I don't know if there's one, yeah, Paul. Yeah, hi, Andrew, and thanks again okay. to your team. And it's fantastic to see the, the impact you guys are having on the youth. Um, and I think we're all kind of excited to see how we can scale this up. Um, and just from my perspective, again, it's a layman's perspective from a million miles away. I think there may be opportunities for if we can find how we influence the good math teachers coming into the system, right? So I know you spoke a bit earlier, but about yeah. you know getting some good maths, and 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 there may be some opportunities for your tutors, you know, with the help of I know I work for Yes, the Youth Employment Service, so where we get you know twelve months of salary sponsored, and to help those you know tutors or to help them move into teaching, and to yeah. create that as a viable career path, um, whether it's with support from the Department of Education, I think that's fundamental because maybe there's further studies required. Um, and, you know, I think just to try and coordinate some of those pieces, I think we can get, get a lot of corporate sponsorship to sponsor salaries, particularly if we can create pathways for for the good uh, uh, the good uh, learners and tutors to become maths teachers and hopefully influence and scale up the impact that you guys do. So, I, I mean, again, this is, it might be there's a lot of practical things I'm not seeing there, but I mm -hmm. think there's an opportunity there. Thanks, Paul, and I appreciate the input. And I'm, I want to I want to throw this to Lynn because I know this – uh, is something she's really getting very excited and passionate about. So, Lynn, do you want to maybe give us some your thoughts on this and your experience? <laughs> no, no, I, want to, I want to thank Vaughan for that suggestion because I, it's it's the sort of drum I've been banging for a while now. You know, we in our in our tutor cohort we have some exceptionally talented teachers. Like they really are. They're not they're not qualified teachers, but they're exceptionally talented. And, you know, we've been working intensely with them, training them. We've got a whole kind of added training program that we're working on. And some of them now have started to do a PGCE in order to enter the system. And my sort of passion is how do we make sure we can, we can properly support those tutors, teachers to stay within the township system? Because currently all the a whole lot of the support um, and the nice programs for people to become teachers are situated in the private schools or the more well-to-do schools. And what I'm desperate to do is to say, can't we get um, some sort of sponsorship to get them into a school governing post within the township school that they're working in so they can work between in school, after school? I think, I mean, I haven't, we haven't fully thought through what this might look like, but I think there's really incredible potential here um, and the problem with sending um, young teachers into township schools is that they're you know by and large very horrible places to work and quite overwhelmingly terrifying etc so the kind of supported um, model where they would continue to get support from Olico um, as they kind of develop as young teachers is something we're very passionate about. So it's definitely, um, um, yeah, thank you for raising that because it's my kind of favorite passion of the moment of thinking about how can we make this happen? Because I, I, I mean, I'd love to almost showcase some of our young teachers. They they went to the AMISA conference, which is the big maths education conference, and they ran workshops for experienced teachers that experienced teachers were raving about. I mean, that's how good they are. They really are excellent. Um, so I'd love to find a way to keep them in the system. Yeah, well, and you can see you've touched um, <laughs> a little passion point there for them. <laughs> um, so Rob, I think we've, we've come in uh, towards the end, end of it. So um, Rob, I think it's probably, and, and Gail, maybe the last two comments. Um, 
uh, if people don't need to leave, we can obviously stay on for a bit, but uh, people are, no, uh, are booked till 11, so please feel free to drop off when 11 comes. But let me hand over to Rob and then go. Okay, quick. I, so I, I wanted to kind of ask a little bit more of an open question, but um, uh, I, I'm not sure that I'm clear on what your constraints to scaling are, apart from just money. And then a suggestion, the foundation phase, people have done quite a lot of work with teaching assistants. This feels like a real parallel to that. And the funding from that came... I think in the end from the presidential youth employment campaign more so than yes i'm not sure why it feels like yes it's got longer term you know a year is better than six months but still so constraints to scaling more than just money yeah thanks rob so uh, obviously um the initial one is staffing is a big um part of it um and and getting there but i actually think to some extent um uh money is is pretty much an important part of it and then it and then it's time um uh so in some sense obviously we're working on a big assumption that what we've done in still a small project is scalable into something much bigger um but one uh but what we could certainly look at in a suburban context where we've got access to good quality tutors from nearby universities um uh, there's there really should be opportunity to build out little hubs, um, uh, whether it's run by ourselves or run by partners, um, implementing partners. Um, uh, it's it's it feels very feasible on that on that front, uh, in a in a suburban context where we've got access to tutors, to quality tutors. So uh, so maybe that speaks a little bit to the to the youth employment piece. Rob is um, is that do you need to have a math background our tutors? Um, um, and that's an important part uh, of the of the piece. So as we're getting more rural, that becomes more difficult. We're working with a number of young people through uh, the Learning Trust um, Catch Up Coalition. Um, uh, we've got a hundred odd of these young people, but most of them are working in our primary school programs, not on our high school piece. Um, so is that a material constraint now that you haven't got enough of a pipeline of tutors? So, so we there is a there's a pipeline is there. So that we we thought it would be a problem when we first started, but you know when Lynn and I sat at at Wits and we interviewed tutors over three or four days when at the very beginning of this um, Xenex project, um, and we must have interviewed uh, about fifty or sixty tu potential tutors, and uh, we could have hired ninety percent of them. They they were really excellent. So. So we're not seeing a constraint there, certainly not in Gauteng um, uh, and uh, Western Cape, uh, might be more so in other places, yeah. Cool, thanks. Gail, would you like to um, close up and then maybe Lynn, if you wanna say a last word as well. Yeah, Thank, thanks, Andrew. Um, I mean, um, I think firstly to say it was important to do this piece of work so we could get proof of concept and talk from, from evidence, as we always say, going forward. Um, but we know when we're looking at proof of concept and we've we've got a fairly controlled environment, the world gets much messier the bigger you 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 go. And and just an, an invitation to say that um we've been engaging with the um, Olico team to now think about what does this mean in terms of scale and embedding in the systems? What other options are there available um, around costs? I think someone asked, what can we do in one year? And maybe there's a look at how we can reduce support over a five-year period. But Andrew, I mean, I, I think if, if you can put out a call again and we can have further discussions, particularly on where do we go to um, from here and we we'd love to you know work with other partners and yourselves on this thank you Gail I really appreciate that and we'll, we'll definitely take you up on that and there's a number of other NGOs as well that are doing really nice work uh, and their own stuff and it'd be great to bring people in and it's one of the things that we've been looking at um, those of us who are members of NASCI as well is how do we uh, more proactively sort of collaborate across particular um, focus areas like mathematics uh, and like high school maths or primary school maths. Um, uh, and I know there's a couple from Ecumbi Youth on the call as well who uh, also partner um, with some of, with us in, in various ways. And so there's lots of opportunities, I think.
Uh, Len, would you like to close us off uh, with the uh, maybe um, um, to end this? No, I mean, I, a very brief, like, firstly, thank you um, to, to everybody for being here and certainly for a, a number of people on the call for the, the, the support that they've given us over the last however long. Um, and in particular, I mean, I think my final little point is that we've learned so much over the course of really working intensely at the senior phase level. Um, and we're certainly looking at ways of feeding that back into the system now in our engagements with the department um, and, and stuff like that. So apart from the program um, that we're running, we're also trying to very much um, play a very positive role within the system or broadly um, in the whole kind of curriculum revision that is coming um, so that some of what we've learned can, can actually feed back into the production of the new curriculum, uh, well, new curriculum, uh, and a strengthened curriculum, um, possibly into um, the uh, materials, uh, workbooks, et cetera. So we're looking to see how we can contribute some of that learning uh, back into the system on that level. Um, uh, yeah, so it's been a really good learning experience, um, yeah. and, and I think we have um, got a lot out of it. Um, and yeah, a big thanks to everybody for being here and, and for their support. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. And I'll just echo that a massive thank you. Very grateful um, to all of you. Um, and uh, be, feel free to reach out and drop us, uh, uh, Lynn or myself or Kylie, um, any of us, uh, any email uh, if you'd like to take this forward. But uh, I, I will make a commitment here publicly, Gail, to take you up on, on that offer um, and keen for us to continue this conversation. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. We'll Bye. Bye.